Hello! Welcome to the second video on reversible computing. Last time I mentioned a paper that I was interested in reading, Reversible Computing from a Programming Language Perspective. And, um, you know, just said I want to read that paper. Then most of the time we sort of went over the Wikipedia entry on reversible computing, just to get a little background. I've been reading this paper a little bit at a time. I'm reading several other papers also on other topics, but uh, this is of interest to me. I often read multiple things at once. Sometimes I'll read a dozen books at the same time, kind of interleaved. I guess I'm the poster child for attention deficit. So um, if I do many things at once, then I can switch between things uh, as I lose my attention or get bored, and then I'll come back to it after a little bit. And it's not even so much that I'm bored of things. I think it's more like my subconscious requires a lot of time to process what I've read. So it's not, you know, if I'm reading a novel that I really like, you know, I might read one page or sometimes one paragraph, and then I got to put it down. Um, I remember reading Anathem by Neil Stevenson, and towards the end, I was so excited uh, with some of the developments that I would read one page, and I had to put a book what, book down for a day. I just couldn't, you know, had to think about what I just uh, read and think about it. So when I read papers, it's kind of the same thing, and I think it's the same thing for me for writing as well. I have to spend a lot of time thinking, and if I switch between different things, that helps me. Anyway, I've been reading this paper. I've got a paper printout for it. Uh, the nice thing about this paper is it's available open access. So if you go to the Elsevier Theoretical Computer Science page, you can actually download the PDF, and I've got it right here. And I also have a printout, which I've been marking up. And I am slowly going through this paper. I've read... I don't know, maybe 10 pages out of 26. Um, I read I read very slowly and very carefully when I'm reading something I care about. So, uh, you know, I often read a section three or four times. Okay, so anyway, I think this is an interesting paper, and I think reversible computing is interesting, and uh, this is really about classical reversible computing, I think. Uh, that seems to be the focus. And it's got some interesting observations even at the beginning. So here's here's something I liked. Um, you can think about forward and backward directions uh, for, for running, say, functions or running procedures you know, or methods. Um, and then there's a deterministic and non-deterministic way to do these things. So in a logic language or a relational language, so if you're thinking prolog or mini-canron, uh, that kind of thing, then you know running a relation forward, whatever you want to consider forward, that can be non-deterministic. You can get multiple answers back. You know you can imagine sort of a probabilistic version or whatever. And uh, if you run it backwards, that can also be non-deterministic. So imagine a Valo and Mini Canron running backwards. We can synthesize, you know, part of the info, you know, a few of the infinitely many programs that evaluate to the list uh, cat, dog, rat, and scheme. Let's say, okay, so very non-deterministic. Forward direction can also be non-deterministic. Um, now, my personal view is if you're if you really believe in relational programming, forward and backward aren't quite the right ideas because there's no such thing as really a forward direction. It's more like you have terms that can contain logic variables uh, and those terms can appear in any position. But if we're taking, say, a scheme functional program and translating it to mini Canron, then sure, there's sort of a natural forward direction and maybe a natural backward direction. Um, reversible languages, which what we're, you know, what's being talked about in this paper, they are deterministic 
going forward and going backwards. In mainstream, languages are deterministic going forward and non-deterministic going backward. And so it talks about talks about that in the paper. Um, you know, so there's, there's a fair amount of interesting information, even just in the setup. Uh, someone asked in the comments, by the way, for the last video, whether or not it's possible to make reversible cellular automata. And apparently the answer is yes. And this paper has references to it. So if you're curious to see what people have explored, I think this the references to this paper are good. Now, I'll mention something about when I read a paper like this, you know, I'll read the abstract, but even before I read the intro, this is just me personally, before I even read the intro usually, I will go all the way to the back of the paper. Now, sometimes there's an appendix or whatever, but um, but I'll go back to where the references are. Okay, so, so here's the references, and there are what? This paper has a fair number. Uh, 119 for a 26-page paper. That's a decent number. And I'll go through, and I'll, I will look at all the references. Now, I'm not going out and reading them, but I want to know what are the papers that this work cites. Um, and I I get a, a few things from that. So one thing I get from this is some sense of what are the important the important uh, pieces of work. And I can tell that because if I read, say, 10 papers on reversible computing, if I see the reference, and these are by different authors, and I see the same paper from 1972 is referenced by all these papers, and it's by a different author than any of those papers, well, probably that's considered a foundational work and uh, it's worth knowing about. So that's one way I find it. Another is just, you know, the topics, you know, the, the titles are very interesting, who the, who the authors are, um, when these are published, where they're published, all that sort of thing sort of gives, builds up some context in my, my head um, and lets me also get some intuitive sense of how maybe the trends for at least that author or the authors writing the particular paper uh, have changed over time. So in any case, I always do that and I always mark up the paper with what what other papers sound interesting to me. And let's see, let me go to my version, see what are a few that I thought were particularly uh, interesting. Okay, well, here's, here we go, the first paper. Combining semantics with non-standard interpreter hierarchies. Whoa. I have no idea what a non-standard interpreter hierarchy is. I don't even know what a standard interpreter hierarchy is. Um, but that sounds interesting. It sounds like maybe this is related to reflective towers of interpreters, something like that. I don't know. Sounds very interesting, though. Uh, I would like to at least know what that paper is about. So, you know, this is the sort of thing where I'd like to at least read the uh, abstracts of these. So that one sounded really interesting. Let's see, what else? Um, here's another one. A simple and efficient uni uh, universal reversible Turing machine. Okay, that sounds cool. I like that. Uh, and then this one excited, excited me quite a bit. What do reversible computers, uh, re sorry, what do reversible programs compute? Wow, that's interesting. So, so just the fact that that question is being asked is interesting. You know, what does it mean to have a reversible computer do, or program do computation? What is it actually computing? Sounds like a philosophical question. Interesting. Um, okay, what else? See uh, this one looks interesting. Reversible machine code and its abstract processor architect architecture sounds very interesting. Okay, it sounds like uh, maybe something to play around with an FPGA. Uh, okay, what else? Okay, here we go. Number sixteen, H. G. Baker. Well, I know who that is. That's Henry Baker, who has maybe the best titles 
for any uh, paper, you know, any set of papers I've ever heard, certainly uh, way up there. Uh, so, you know, uh, there's Friedman and Wise, Kahn should not evaluate his argument, and Henry, Henry Baker had Kahn should not Kahn's this argument, and uh, there's uh, Cheney on the MTA paper and all that stuff, so. And then here's another fantastic title, In Reversal of Fortune, The Thermodynamics of Garbage Collection. Oh, sounds great. Love it. Love it. Okay. Okay, Charles Bennett. I think it's Charles Bennett. Logical uh, Reversibility of Computation, 1973. IBM Journal of Research, something like that. Sounds great. Sounds foundational. Uh, let's see. Mm, what else? Oh, 22. I like 22. Uh, data structures and dynamic memory management in reversible languages. Well, that sounds cool. How do you do dynamic memory management with reversible computing? All right, here we've got Edgar Dystra. Program inversion. Okay, great. So that's from 1978. Anything by Dijkstra is worth taking a look at. Uh, what do we have? Uh, 30. A reversible operational semantics for imperative programming languages. Okay. Cool. Um, got a couple uh, Richard Feynman, Dick Feynman. References, quantum mechanical computers, cool. Reversible computation in the thermodynamics of computing, chapter five, and the Feynman Lectures on Computation, which is an interesting book. That's probably the first time I heard about reversible computing was in the Feynman Lectures on Computational, on Computation. Um, with the Edward, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, with the, uh, uh, Fredkin, Edward Fredkin. He, uh, Feynman was good friends with Fredkin. I think they shared an office for a while. Okay, what else? Oh, yeah, here we go. Number 35, uh, Mike Frank. Reversibility for Efficient Computing, PhD Thesis, MIT Cambridge, 1999. And his advisor uh, was Tom Knight, who seems to have had his hand in just almost everything I'm interested in. Okay, so that's a, that's a dissertation. I mean, I've, I've actually looked up that dissertation. I haven't read it yet, but I've seen a number of talks by Mike Frank on reversible computing. Uh, very interesting. And he's organized at least one conference. He's at Sandia. Uh, very interesting work. I like it a lot. Okay, uh, what else? A method for automatic program inversion based on LR zero parsing. Huh. What's the combination or, you know, what's the uh, connection between parsing and automatic program inversion? That sounds interesting. Revisiting an automatic program inverter for Lisp. There we go. Lisp and program inversion. Great. Um... Okay, this one sounds interesting. On the degeneration of program generators by program composition. I have no idea what that even means, but it sounds really interesting. Uh, oh, 45. Okay, so Turchin is a, the um, person who, who researched uh, super compilation the creator of super compilation, I believe. Application of metasystem transition to function inversion and transformations. Sounds very interesting. Okay, cool. Uh, 46 sounds interesting. A linear time self-interpreter of a reversible imperative language. Well, the imperative part, I'm maybe not, not uh, so thrilled with because the, the things I do are, are easier to deal with when it's functional, um, but linear time self-interpreter of a reversible language. That sounds cool. All right, excuse me. <clears throat> that sounds very interesting. Uh, 47, a minimalist reversible while language. 
Okay, I like that, minimalism. I could definitely get into that. What else do we have? Uh, 48, constructing a binary tree from its traversals by re reversible recursion and iteration. Hmm. Sounds, uh, sounds very synthesis-y. It sounds also kind of mini-canrony, so that one stuck out. Uh, 51, what's 51? Okay, here we go. Transforming interpreters into inverse interpreters by partial evaluation. Oh, I love it. That sounds really cool. Really cool. All right. That sounds very interesting. A lot of papers to read. From reversible programming languages to reversible meta languages. That sounds very cool. Anything having to do with meta computation or meta programming. Very powerful. So that sounds extremely interesting. Here we go. Implementing reversible object-oriented language features on reversible machines. Okay, now we're talking reversible machines for reversible language features and implementation. So that sounds interesting. Okay. 60. Reversible non-deterministic finite automata. Well, that sounds interesting, because, especially since I played around uh, somewhat with synthesis with finite automata, and the fact that it's non-deterministic and they're reversible, that's interesting to me. So does that mean that the first step is that they turn the NFA into to, uh, DFAs first and then do so, or, or is there something about the non-deterministic aspect they can take advantage of? I don't know. Um, and then, okay, so 65 looked interesting. Semi-inversion of conditional constructor term rewriting systems. I don't know what semi-inversion is, but uh, term rewriting systems, that's, those are bread and butter for computation. So I've been looking at term rewriting systems a lot. This one looks really interesting to me. A reversible SEMCD machine. Okay, I don't know what an SEMCD machine is. I know what an SECD machine is. And I played around with you know, those sorts of machines, trying to implement those in Mini Canrin uh, to make them you know, run backwards and do synthesis and all that with you know, not a huge amount of success, to be honest. Um, so I'm curious if, uh, you know, if, if the reversible approach to this machine has some secret sauce. And I even have a little note to myself, ooh, uh, could these techniques let us handle small step and disconnected wires? And so small step is one way to do an interpreter. So you could, or a rewrite system or a reducer. You know, you can have big step interpreters, which is like scheme and scheme. Uh, the standard Lisp and Lisp style interpreter, the interpreter I talk about in the most beautiful program ever written. That's a big step machine, or sorry, big step interpreter. So you take an expression, you reduce, reduce it all the way down to a value, like kind of all at once. There are also small step machines where you do like term rewriting and, and you rewrite a state, you know, one little transformation at a time. Uh, and there's always this context or state that you have to, in, um, you, you can't just look at the expression to figure out what its value is, you, there's all this sort of context that you you have to pay attention to. It's sort of like a continuation. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, there, you know, those are a good way to do semantics in some sense, um, or, or a nice way to write machines. However, in Mini Canrin, when we're trying to do synthesis, it turns out the small step nature of those reductions mm, we, we end up running into our problems with conjunction where conjunction is not really commutative. And we end up, whenever you have, whenever you have to do a bunch of reductions, like in a loop, uh, that type of thing, it just doesn't work, run backwards very well. We enter it, enter what's called generate and test. So anyway, uh, that one's interesting to me because you know, I, I want to know, okay, is there some secret sauce uh, or can we create some sort of hybrid system? You know, the paper also mentions hybrid systems that are hybrid reversible, non-reversible systems in, in this uh, overview.
paper that we're looking at the references for. And so I wonder if there could be hybrid systems that are kind of mini Kenrin, um, you know, like sort of relational meets reversible or relational meets reversible meets uh, non-reversible, non-relational. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Let's just go through some more of these. I take, uh, you know, trying to collect these references very seriously because, you know, often that's the best part of a paper with lots of references or the most useful part is finding out about all this juicy work you didn't know about. So let's see, I had something down here. Yeah, I think this was it. Reversible space equals deterministic space. Hmm, sounds like a very important result. And and notice that you know this is this is only from two thousand, which okay, so that is twenty four years ago, but um, you know it wasn't from like nineteen fifty, right? So it's interesting that some of these results are are quite recent. And what else? Seventy seven. I put a star. A formal approach to undo operations in programming languages. Oh, well, that sounds kind of interesting. And 80. Sparkle. There's also Sparkle. So the Sparkle. A language for partially invertible computation. Well, I don't know what that means. Partially invertible. Sounds interesting. Oh. We have John McCarthy, two papers. Well, here are the recursive function of symbolic expressions and their computation by machine. Yeah, that one, that's a classic from 1960. So I've, I've read that one multiple times. But this one I didn't know about. Uh, the inversion of functions defined by Turing machines. Okay, so this is Claude Shannon, John McCarthy editors, automata studies, um, 1956. Great. So that sounds like a very interesting paper. Of course, Claude, Claude Shannon is known for all the work in information theory. Automata studies. My understanding, you know, John McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence and organized this AI conference uh, when he was at Dartmouth. And originally, I think they were trying to, or he was trying to hold, I mean, a conference called Automata Studies. He was calling it Automata Studies, or maybe Shannon thought it should be called Automata Studies. They were trying to do what now we would call symbolic AI, or at least artificial intelligence of some sort. And apparently the original phrase used was Automata Studies. I have to look at, figure out who, who exactly came up with that phrase or thought it was a good idea. But um, you know, obviously Automata were very big at the at that time, uh, but my understanding is that also was sort of the working name for the first, uh, you know, what, what people were doing in the early days of AI. Anyway, that looks interesting. Any, anything by McCarthy is interesting to me. I think it's just full of interesting ideas. Here we go. RSSA, a reversible SSA form. Oh, so static single assignment, is reversible. Very interesting. Okay. What else? Um, reversible garbage collection for reversible functional languages. Here we go. Functional programming. Reversible garbage collection. That sounds interesting. Reversible functional array programming. Sounds interesting. And Hermes, a reversible language for lightweight encryption. All right. So well, this is a series of interesting profiling papers. 93, I have a note. Reversible computation and term rewriting. That sounds very interesting to me. Very, very interesting. Been thinking about reversible term rewriting recently. Uh, 95, on a class of reversible primitive recursive functions and its Turing complete extensions. Hmm, that sounds interesting. It sounds very foundational. Uh, what's the year of that 2018? Well, 
still uh, still new tricks for reverse uh, for primitive recursive functions apparently uh, in 2018 mm, what else okay so that was 95 96 source code transformations for efficient reversible reversibility that sounds pretty cool and I liked what else uh, Ninety-seven introduction to reversible computing. Okay, there's a book, CRC Press, twenty fourteen. There are a few books. I think, I think this list contains maybe three books on reversible computing. Um, yeah, I might end up getting those. Uh, I think that could be helpful. I, I do have to say that a lot of times these books are not great. Um, hopefully, this one would be, but sometimes you get one of these books and you're like, oh dear. <laughs> you know, it's, it, uh, they're, they're not all winners, but, you know, if you're trying to get into a new field, finding a few books can be uh, really useful. So the, you know, I should probably go ahead and get some of these, a lot of these books. Okay. CRC press, they're famous for making, you know, it's a chemical rubber corporation. You know, they make the CRC handbook of like chemistry and physics, which is this gigantic thing you can use as a doorstop. Um, you know, the book's not cheap. You know, most most of these types of books are going to be expensive, but, you know, maybe you can find it used or whatever. All right. Okay. Real-time methods and reversible computation. Huh. Well, that sounds interesting. Oh, look, Cravine, like the lazy Cravine machine in re proceedings of reversible uh, computation. Okay, that sounds cool. Okay, on the languages accepted by finite reversible automata. All right, so a lot of automata, a lot of reversible automata, a lot of reversible rewrite systems. You know, just getting a sense of the sorts of things people think about. Uh, on reversible subroutines and computers that run backwards. This sounds really cool. I just like the title of this, okay? 1965. Great. So this must be, it's either foundational or at least maybe you can see people having these interesting thoughts. So, you know, 65, people were thinking about this stuff. Okay. Here we go. One or two. Reversible languages and incremental state saving and optimistic parallel discrete event simulation. Oh. Parallel, optimistic parallel discrete event simulation. Hmm. Well, sounds like an interesting application, maybe. Um, 104, what do we have? Reversible arithmetic logic unit for quantum arithmetic. Okay. That sounds like that could be interesting. I just don't know that much about quantum stuff in terms of quantum computing. I mean, I've read about it some. Uh, I've taken a course on it, but... Um, but I'd be just curious with the idea of reversible arith arithmetic logic unit in general, because, you know, we've got the Oleg arithmetic and mini Canron. Well, that was all based on an ALU, half adders and adders and all that stuff. So I wonder if they have a reversible version of any of that stuff. That's something I wanted to play with around, around with anyway. I think people have done reversible adders and half adders, I think. Uh, should look at that up. Okay, uh, let's see, is there anything else? Uh, inver invertible cellular automata review. Okay, so if you want to know about invertible cellular automata, here's your chance. That's a Tefali. Uh, okay, so like Tefali gate. Reversible computing, Tefali, automata languages and programming, uh, 1980. All right, here we have Churchin again. Well, they're two Turchins, okay? So we have, I think it's VF Turchin. Experiments with a supercompiler and Lisps and functional programming. Great. And then I've got the last few. Okay, 109. Reversible computations in logic programming. Oh, look at that. Okay, that's a must read right there. Definitely have to read that one. I, I have uh, four stars next to that one. Two stars on either side of, ooh, that's my comment. 
Um, okay, 110. Oh, look at that. Tom Knight. Tom Knight and Mike Frank. A fully reversible, asymptotically zero energy microprocessor. I think I did look up this paper. Um, you know, asymptotically zero energy microprocessor. You know, that's uh, Tom Knight's a computer architect, so that's the sort of thing you'd be interested in. Very cool. All right, what else we got? 114. A reversible programming language and its invertible self-interpreter. That sounds cool. That sounds very cool. That sounds right up my alley. Um, and... Oh, yeah, 113. Sounds interesting, possibly. Cyrec. A hardware description language for the specification and synthesis of reversible circuits. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I think this is just like a hardware description language like VHDL or Verilog or, you know, was it BlueSpec or whatever. Um, but it's f specifically for reversible circuits. Okay, that's cool. All right. I think that's it as far as, is that, oh, now I, I also had, okay, so there's this R fun <clears throat> towards a reversible functional language. I think that's the R fun language and, and a note, I have a note to myself to implement that. All right, so that's how I started reading this paper was going by and going to the end and trying to read all these uh, you know, try and try and look at the at the cited work. Um, so I started reading this paper seriously, the printout on March twenty third. So it's March thirtieth. Okay, uh, Saturday, March twenty third. That's when I really started it, and I found a lot of it quite interesting. So was, you know, I'm also writing down kind of what I'm confused about. So. You know, the paper talks about program inversion and inverse interpretation. And I'm not sure what exactly that means and what's the, or sorry, yeah, program inversion and inverse interpretation. So what's the difference? I'm not sure. Also, I learned that clean is a technical term, which means garbage free. So I think last time we were talking a little bit about how there's this idea of garbage you know, garbage bits when you're trying to create these reversible circuits um, where you might have to have extra bits that, you know, sort of don't do anything useful. They're, you know, they, they just, uh, they're there for no reason other than to make the reversible stuff work. And uh, it's, it's a bit of a problem. It's like to make the number of inputs and outputs the same, I guess. Um, I don't really understand garbage yet, but here the, in this paper, they focus on clean reversible languages. So that means no garbage. Okay. So this is, you know, they're, they're trying to simplify uh, the sorts of systems that they're studying here. So it's not going to be quantum. I don't think we're not going to have garbage. So, you know, the, the, you know, they're trying to keep, keep the model as simple as possible to try to get at the uh, sort of the essence of what's going on. Um, and they talk about why you might want reversible computing. And I thought this was interesting. Okay, so quantum computing, qu uh, computing models, sure, you need reversible computing, is my understanding. But here, bio-inspired computing models, uh, that was interesting, where erasure is considered harmful. So I didn't know that there was bio-computing or bio-inspired computing where erase erasure of information was considered harmful. And, and then I love this little phrase. So here uh, they say something very interesting that reversible computing, like quantum mechanics, has its own different sort of philosophical interpretations. You know, how do, how do you think about this? There's, you know, uh, as with the interpretation of quantum mechanics, there's been no uniform interpretation of what reversible computing is what we present is the Copenhagen or Copenhagen interpretation of reversible computing, which is funny because since that's the famous interpretation for quantum mechanics and because Robert is at Diku 
at the University of Copenhagen. So I, I, I appreciated that humor. Uh, let's see what else. Oh yeah, okay, so here I was just reading through and uh, you know, situating reversible computing. So this is comparing reversible computing to different types of, of language. And then for logic languages, so I thought that was interesting. You know, there's a little bit about logic languages here. Uh, now, maybe the most interesting thing on this page is actually this footnote. Uh, right here, footnote four on page two, I found very interesting. So it says, all right, whoops. Yeah, hold on, let me go back to page two. All right, so page two has this figure that we already looked at. So figure one on top of page two shows his different paradigms, right? And so we have forward direction, backward direction. We have non-deterministic or deterministic. What footnote four is pointing out is that there's actually one more entry you could imagine, which is a, a type of language where the forward direction is non-deterministic, but the backward direction would be deterministic. Or like if you inverted or reversed things, you would go from non-deterministic to deterministic. And uh, what footnote four says is that languages classified as ND are those that have the transition of mainstream languages turned around. That is, their forward direction is non-deterministic while their backward direction is deterministic. Their application has not been studied in depth. The closest is the idea of using non-deterministic languages with deterministic backtracking, and then they have a reference to 33. Another example is the reversible non-deterministic finite automata, rev in FA, reference 60. Well, what's 33? So 33 is Floyd, okay, non-deterministic algorithms, 1967, journal ACM. Okay, all right, and then what's 60? 60 is reversible non-deterministic finite automata. Okay. So what I find interesting, you know, wh whenever I'm reading a paper like this, especially in a research context, which, well, now I read everything in a research context in some sense, um, I, I really look out for things like this, especially if the author is, you know, pointed out that's nice. But if you see this sort of table and you realize that, hey, there should be four entries, not three. There are four possibilities, not three what's the missing possibility? What's the missing type of language? And so here they, they very helpfully and astutely point out that there is such a, such a missing entry and they, they give a couple examples of what might be closest to it, but they say these, this magic phrase, their application has not been studied in depth. So if you are looking for a research project or a research area, you know, or if you're interested in computational archaeology, there you go, right there. It's laid out for you. That's a PhD worth of study right there, is to figure out what goes in that missing uh, line, okay? And and what would you use it for, and what's the theory of it, and so forth. And you know, I've got a couple couple pointers, uh, but that that to me is gold. You know, if you can read something like this and uh, find the part where people just don't understand it or it hasn't been studied, well, there you go. You got something to work on. You know, come back in 20 years. Okay. Uh, figure two I thought was kind of cool. So hardware and software stack. Okay, so full stack. I'm going to be a full stack reversible developer. You know, I'll put that on LinkedIn. Um, okay, so we have physical implementation gate level, computer architecture, machine code, high level languages, and algorithms. Logically reversible language, physically reversible language. So um, I don't know that much about any of these things really. So, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly what physical implementation versus gate level means. I mean, maybe this means like the actual process and doping of silicon and, you know, things like that, like the, the substrate and how, uh, how the gates are built and the transistors and all those sorts of things. And, uh, I'm not sure. 
I guess maybe you if you're building it to Folly Gate or Fredkin Gate, it really matters, you know, kind of how that physical implementation works. I'm sure it does, especially with efficiency. If you're trying to go for uh, extremely efficient computation, I'm sure exactly what the physical implementation is has a huge effect. Um, so anyway, I, I think that's interesting to think about the entire stack. And like I was saying last time, I don't know how far people have gotten in building like a full system, you know, this full stack. Has anyone actually gotten something working all the way from bottom to the top and how close have they gotten to sort of the ideals uh, that you could get theoretical savings or, you know, that kind of thing. I don't have any sense of that, but I think it's interesting. Uh, okay, here they talk about injective, and I wrote a little note to myself, injective is one-to-one. -one. Uh, I I have to say injective and surjective, I, I swear I have to look those up every time. Uh, I hate that. I really hate that terminology. Okay. Oh, okay, so here's... Uh, this was interesting, I thought. Our focus is on semantically clean reversible languages and computational models like the reversible Turing machines whose programs are composed in ways that preserve the injectivity, that's what I wrote, one-to-one-ness, of uh, their program units and compute injective functions without semantic modification. This guarantees full transparency and control over garbage data. Okay, that's obviously a very important concept at the programming language level. The rationale behind this approach is straightforward. We want to be able to build 100% clean reversible computing systems that can compute injective functions without global undo mechanisms such as tracing or rollbacks. Okay, so it's interesting that they want that. Um, I don't know why they want that. Is it because these mechanisms are complex? Is it because these mechanisms, you know, require a whole bunch of more gates if you're implementing systems? Is it because the mechanisms some, somehow inherently, you know, remove a lot of the benefits of reversibility? I'm not sure. Or are they just trying to optimize it? So I'm, I'm just a little curious about that. I don't know enough to know what the implications are of having traces or rollbacks. Um, okay, here I have three stars, so something I thought was important. Uh, okay, here we go. A few tomorrow projections. All right, here's, here's what I thought was interesting. Known metacomputational uh, methods such as the Futamura projections, Futamura projections, establish a relation of inverse interpreters and program inverters and lend themselves to reversible program specification, specific transformation schemes. Okay, I thought that sounded interesting and deep. So things like Futamura projections, which are well known, that talk about interpreters, compilers, uh, partial evaluation those sorts of things, connections between different, these different uh, approaches to computation. Apparently there's an equivalent notion of that for reversible computing and for reversible, you know, sorry, invertible uh, interpreters, that kind of thing. So that, that sounded interesting. It sounded deep. And here we go. I thought the... Copenhagen implementation. Okay, here are the five cornerstones. And I particularly part, uh, thought uh, parts three through five were interesting. And that's uh, about as far as I got there. I didn't get into some of those details. And then, you know, when I'm reading one of these papers, it's hard. I'll just kind of jump around a bit when I get stuck. I'll just jump forward. And so I started reading another part, section five, which here we go. Cornerstones of reversible programming languages. Also, I was just cutting to the chase because this is kind of what I really wanted to know. You know as they say, uh, you're not reading a scroll, so you can jump forward. Um, 
And so here it's talking about a bare minimum reversible language consists of three elements, reversible assignment, reversible while loop, and dynamic data structures. Wow, that sounds disgusting. I don't want reversible assignment. I don't want any assignment. I want it to be functional. And I don't want while loops. But I assume this could be also viewed in a functional way because, uh, you know, there were some cited papers on doing functional programming, or at least trying to get towards functional programming. Um, yeah, so here I started. Uh, I have some comments. Let's see. Maybe I'll mention a few of those. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a few comments, so let me just go through those quickly and... Uh, the, the other thing is the next page, they actually give an example of uh, Fibonacci and calling and uncalling Fibonacci. Oh, uncalling. So let's see here. All right. I have a comment that this paragraph is super inspiring. And I don't know if it is this paragraph. I think so. As a minimum, constructor-based data structures are built from a single binary constructor and a single symbol. This reversible core language, R core, is computationally as powerful as a reversible Turing machine. I say, like, oh, very exciting. I don't know how, I don't know how powerful a reversible Turing machine is. So, is that, is that Turing complete, or is it sub-Turing complete? I don't, I don't know. But anyway, it sounded cool. I like, I like how minimum it is. A single binary constructor, single symbol. Okay, that that. Reminds me of logic, uh, what the sorts of things you can do with, with logic. Uh, and then this paragraph I, th I found was very interesting. And in particular, I, I love this notion. Okay, so inverse computation of a program unit by uncalling a procedure um, while the standard computation of the same procedure is invoked as usual by a call. So you can have a program and you can uncall it. You know, the, you invoke the inverse computation with you by uncalling it. And in the same program, you also call the, the forward version or the regular version. So I guess uncalling a procedure is just calling a procedure's inverse. Is that what that means? I don't know. But I just love this idea of uncalling a procedure. I mean, anytime you have notion like a procedure call, you ha you have something totally different that that excites me. Uh, that's the sort of thing that it's like, wow, that's weird. Okay, what what in the world could uncalling a procedure mean? And it also reminds me of uh, normalization by evaluation, where Edward Komet showed me, you know, you have eval, but you also have uneval. It's like, whoa, what is uneval? And so here we have call and uncall. And so that also made me wonder, I had a comment here, okay, if you have inverse computation and you have call and uncall, so if you do that for an interpreter, is that basically giving you normalization by evaluation? You know, are your call and uncall like avalo and unavalo? Or the, I mean, un avalo and unavalo? Or the, is there something different there? I don't know. Uh, but it sounds like, like there should be some sort of connection there, or, or might be, I don't know. But I, I found this paragraph really interesting. Um, and then here is a interesting sentence. Reversible programming demands certain sacrifices because data cannot be overwritten and join points in the control flow require explicit assertions, a technique known from program inversion. So you know, what's program inversion versus you know, reversible computation. So so a lot of these technical terms, I don't have my head wrapped around them yet. I don't know what program inversion is versus invertible programming or reversible programming. You know, obviously there's some relationship. You can just tell from the names there's some sort of relationship, but, uh, you know, these are all technical terms or terms of art, and I don't understand very well, you know, what, what the differences are. So that's one thing I'd like to figure out. Um, but also, you know, okay, sacrifice, uh, you know, demand certain sacrifices. Well, I'm certainly used to making certain sacrifices from uh, relational computing. 
So I'm curious what the nature is of these sacrifices. Data cannot be overwritten. Okay, so if you don't use mutation, like if you're in a purely functional setting, you don't use mutation, then are you overwriting data? Or if you use recursion, if you don't pass through the original data or pass through information so you can recover the original data, is that overwriting, even if you're not using explicit mutation? I'm not sure what what the implications of some of these are because you know I don't I'm not thinking in terms of assignment and and, and uh, reversible while loops. By the way, with reversible assignment, that reminds me a little of the Warren abstract machine for Prolog, where you have this trail where you can undo you can kind of run the computation backwards to undo all the assignments to get back to the choice point. Um, so it sounds like that maybe has some connections to uh, reversible computing. I don't know. I don't know what the relationship is. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, and there was one more thing. Lossless encoder and decoder. Uh, the possibility to call and uncall the same procedure enables a new form of reliability through code sharing. I don't know what that is. Instead of, oh, oh I, okay, I think I do know. Instead of writing two separate procedures that are inverse to each other, for example, a lossless encoder and decoder, it is sufficient to implement tests and verify one of them and to attain the effect of the other by an uncall. Okay. Um, interesting. And, and I was wondering when I was reading this, like, okay, is this a way you could do synthesis? Can you do program synthesis using any of these techniques? Um, yeah, I don't know. But very, very interesting. And in here, I was trying to make sense of the these programs. I have to say, these I find this really hard to read. You know, like, wait, are these like globals? And uh, what are the initial values of these variables? There, there's a lot of missing trying to understand this thing. You know, what's the scope of these variables? This, I found the syntax really weird. I don't even know what what some of these means. Is that like a, an equality or a swap or something? I don't know. I can't tell uh, yet what these things are. I have to do a lot more. Um, but I, I found it pretty weird. Or is this a cons? For some reason, I thought this was like a pairing op operation, maybe. Maybe it's returning both of those. Yeah. I don't know. I, I find this kind of weird. I also find it kind of disgusting because it looks like it's full of mutation, like this thing. So, you know, I want to see, is, is there a, a functional version of this stuff? I mean, it could be useful, but it's still disgusting. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and then I think I had a couple more comments at the very end. Yeah, there we go. Let's go all the way, all the way to 7. Section 7. Uh, you can see I was sort of skipping around. Reversible programming languages in general. Okay. Okay. Uh, typically R Turing complete general purpose languages such as imperative, functional, and object-oriented languages. Well, I noticed there's, what about rela relational or logic or constraint languages? There's, those aren't mentioned. Uh, so I wasn't sure about that. And then here for domain specific hybrid reversible, irreversible languages, that sounds interesting. Okay, so that sounds like, you know, maybe, maybe like the sort of thing you get from an embedded DSL in a host language, or maybe it's more like constraint logic programming or functional logic programming where you're smushing two paradigms together. I don't know. Don't know what that means. Um, version of the buddy memory algorithm. A re recent reversible memory manager uses a reversible version of the buddy manage memory algorithm. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> I can ask ChatGPT, I guess. Um, on the other hand, oh, sorry. On the other end of the abstraction spectrum are reversible machine languages. Okay, that sounds cool. And let's see. For this paragraph, I said, cool, has anyone created, 
a full system outside of quantum computing. So I assume for quantum computing, they have they have the full stack uh, because I know they've done things like Shor's algorithm to factor 15 or whatever. You know, some very small numbers. Supposedly they factored that. Uh, early point-free functional language with relational semantics. In bio bio earth, I don't know. I don't, anyway, sounds like there's probably some work here that looks interesting. Relational semantics, point free functional language. I've learned that when someone talks about relational semantics, that doesn't mean that it has anything to do with Mini Kenrin. Um, maybe, but maybe not. But anyway, point free functional language. Point free is when you basically you use uh, procedure calls for everything and try to avoid variable names. You know, it's just a big chain of function calls. Um, Point-free functional language, okay. And then what else? Uh, I said, what does this mean? Access, uh, where was it? Hmm. Access to a program's inverse semantics. I think this is the second time I've seen this phrase. Uh, I don't know what that phrase means. Access to a program's inverse semantics. That seems to be an important notion here. That was part of the Copenhagen interpretation. That's like part of a key part of reversible computing, I guess, is having access to a program's inverse semantics. I don't know what that means, though. I can guess, but I don't really know. Dissected Bennett's classical reversibilization. reversibilization. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. And this is an interesting phrase. Even without reversible computers, there is a great potential to the investigations because they bring new theories and tools to the table of computing. Okay. Um, I guess that might answer my question about if people have ever built one of these um, all the way. And... Let's see here. What do we have there? Quantum versions of the reversible gates can only perform uniform, uh, unitary transformations, blah, blah, blah. As an unexpected connection, the computation power of a DNA-based computation model is demonstrated by constructing a theoretically reversible computing device which is a reversible logic element with memory. Okay, that sounds interesting. And then reversible Turing machines are not the most restrictive computation model that has rich expressiveness. And examples are the self-inverse Turing machines and linear transformations. Okay, don't know what that means, but sounds interesting. And then uh, in short, reversible comp computation is emerging field of computer science that encompasses all aspects of computing theoretical, practical, technical, and applied, and complements many of the traditional fields, it is here to stay. Well, good. All right, well, I'll keep reading, and uh, you know, I am interested to find out about all these things I didn't know existed. It sounds like there are a lot of interesting sounding papers to take a look at. I might at least uh, you know, do something like read all the abstracts from all those papers and then decide what to look at next. Well, hope you find this interesting. Uh, I definitely recommend this paper if you're interested in reversible computing. And, you know, uh, certainly parts of it you will be able to read even if you don't know about quantum computing or whatever. There might be some things that are kind of tricky, but there are certainly ideas that you'll be able to get from it. Or maybe you're an expert and you can understand it and then you can tell me um, and I'll be able to understand better. Either way, you know, sounds like there are a lot of interesting ideas here, which is, uh, and, and it sounds like they're related to relational programming. So I'm going to keep digging around and, you know, finish this paper, I hope, or at least get as close as I can to finishing the paper and then switch over to some others that are related. And at some point, start writing some stuff in Mini Kenrin maybe, or, or think about a, you know, what happens when Mini Kenrin meets relational programming. All right. 
I hope you all are doing well and talk to you soon.